Pastor Dan here again to read some more of the Chronicles of Narnia. We are on chapter 7, and if you remember, we just left off with, um, with Shasta hiding in the tombs, the king's tombs, and uh, someone uh, coming guiding the horses to where he was. Um, but Shasta not knowing who that someone was, and we have no idea what happened to them or how they got to that situation or where Erebus is or anything like that. So uh, let's read chapter 7, Erebus in Tashban. What had really happened was this. When Erebus saw Shasta hurried away by the Narnians, and found herself alone with, the, with two horses who, very wisely, wouldn't say a word, she never lost her head even for a moment. She grabbed Bree's halter and stood still holding both the horses, and though her heart was beating as hard as a hammer, she did nothing to show it. As soon as the Narnian lords had passed, she tried to move on again. But before she could take a step, another crier, bother all these people, thought Erebus, was heard shouting out, way, way, way for the Tarkina, La Saraline. And immediately following the crier came four armed slaves and then four bearers carrying a litter which was all a flutter with silken curtains and all a jingle with silver bells and which scented the whole street with perfumes and flowers. After the litter, female slaves in beautiful clothes, and then a few grooms, runners, pages, and the like. And now, Erebus made her first mistake. She knew La Saraline quite well, almost as if they had been at school together, because they had often stayed in the same houses and been to the same parties. And Erebus couldn't help looking up to see what La Saraline looked like, now that she was married and a very great person indeed. It was fatal. The eyes of the two girls met, and immediately La Saraline sat up in the litter and burst out at the top of her voice, Erevis! What on earth are you doing here? Your father! There was not a moment to lose. Without a second's delay, Erevis let go of the horses, caught the edge of the litter, swung herself up beside La Saraline, and whispered furiously in her ear, Shut up! Do you hear? Shut up! You must hide me! Tell your people... Darling, began La Sarline in the same loud voice. She didn't in the least mind making people stare. In fact, she rather liked it. Do what I tell you or I'll never speak to you again, hissed Erebus. Please, please be quick. Laz, it's frightfully important. Tell your people to bring those two horses along. Pull all the curtains of the litter and get away somewhere where I can't be found. And do hurry. All right, darling said La Saraline in her lazy voice. Here, two of you take the Tarquina's horses, this was to the slaves, and now home. I say, darling, do you think we really want the curtains drawn on a day like this? I mean to say. But Erebus had already drawn the curtains, enclosing La Saraline and herself in a rich and scented but rather stuffy kind of tent. I mustn't be seen, she said. My father doesn't know I'm here. I'm running away. My dear, how perfectly thrilling, said La Sarline. I'm dying to hear all about it. Darling, you're sitting on my dress. Do you mind? That's better. It is a new one. Do you like it? I got it at last. Do be serious, said, La Sar said Erebus. Where is my father? Didn't you know? said La Sarline. He's here, of course. He came to town yesterday and is asking about you everywhere. And to think of you and me being here together and his not knowing anything about it. It's the funniest thing I ever heard. And she went off into giggles. She always had been a terrible giggler, as Erebus now remembered. It isn't funny at all, she said. It's dreadfully serious. Where can you hide me? No difficulty at all, dear girl, said La Sarline. I'll take you home. My husband's away and no one will see you. Phew, it's not much fun with the curtains drawn. I want to see people. There's no point in having a new dress on if it one's to go about shut up like this. I hope no one heard you when you shouted out to me like that, said Erebus. 
No, no, of course, darling, said Miss Arline absent-mindedly. But you haven't even told me yet what you think of the dress. Another thing, said Erebus, you must tell your people to treat those two horses very respectfully. That's part of the secret. They're really talking horses from Narnia. Fancy, said La Sarline. How exciting. And, oh, darling, have you seen the barbarian queen from Narnia? She's staying in Tashbetan at present. They say Prince Rabidash is madly in love with her. There have been the most wonderful parties and hunts and things all this last fortnight. I can't see that she's so very pretty myself, but some of the Narnian men are lovely. I was taken out on a river party the day before yesterday, and I was wearing my... How should we prevent pe your people telling everyone you, that you've got a visitor, dressed like a beggar's brat in your house? It might so easily get round to my father. Now, don't keep on fussing like that. There, There's a dear, said La Sarmi. We'll get you some proper clothes in a moment. And here we are. The bearers had stopped, and the litter was being lowered. When the curtains had been drawn, Erevis found that she was in a courtyard garden, very like the one that Shasta had been in, been taken to a few minutes earlier in another part of the city. Lasarline would have gone indoors at once, but Erevis reminded her in a frantic whisper to say something to the slaves about not telling anyone of their mistress's strange visitor. Sorry, darling, it had gone right out of my head, said Lasarline. Here, all of you, and you, doorkeeper. No one is to be let out of the house today, and anyone I catch talking about this young lady will first be beaten to death, and then burned alive, and after that be kept on bread and water for six weeks. There. Although Lasarline had said she was dying to hear Erevis's story, she showed no sign of really wanting to hear it at all. She was, in fact, much better at talking than at listening. She insisted on Erevis having a long and luxurious bath, calamine baths are famous, and then dressing her up in the finest clothes before she would let her explain anything. The fuss she made about choosing the dresses nearly drove Erevis mad. She remembered now that Lasarline had always been like that, interested in clothes and parties and gossip. Erevis had always been more interested in bows and arrows and horses and dogs and swimming. You will guess that each thought the other silly. But when at last they were both seated after a meal, it was chiefly, chiefly of whipped cream and jelly and fruit and ice sort in a beautiful pillared room, which Erevis would have liked better if Lasarline's spoiled pet monkey hadn't been climbing about it all the time. Lasarline at last asked her why she was running away from home. When Erevis had finished telling her story, Lasarline said, But darling, why don't you marry a host of Tarkin? Everyone's crazy about him. My husband says he is beginning to be one of the greatest men in Calorman. He has just been made Grand Vizier now that old uh, Arsaktha, Aksar, Aksartha, who, excuse me, has died, didn't you know? I don't care. I can't stand the sight of him, said Erevis. But darling, only think, three palaces, and one of them, that beautiful one down on the lake at Ilkeen, positively ropes of pearls, I'm told, baths of ass's milk, and you'd see such a lot of me. He can keep his pearls and palaces as far as I'm concerned, said Erevis. You always were a queer girl, Erevis, said Lasarline. What more do you want? In the end, however, Erevis managed to make her friend believe that she was in earnest in, and even to discuss plans. There would be no difficulty now about getting the two horses out of the north gate and then on to the tombs. No one would stop or question a groom in fine clothes leading a war horse and a lady's saddle horse down to the river, and Lasarline had plenty of grooms to send. It wasn't so easy to decide what to do about Erevis herself. She suggested that she could be carried out in the litter with the curtains drawn, but Lasarline told her that the litters were only used in the city, and the sight of one going out through the gate would be certain to lead to questions. 
When they had talked for a long time, and it was all the longer, because Erebus found it hard to keep her friend to the point, at last Lasarline clapped her hands and said, Oh, I have an idea. There is one way of getting out of the city without using the gates. The Tisrock's garden, may live forever, runs right down to the water, and there is a little water door. Only for the palace people, of course. But then, you know, dear, here she tittered a little, we almost are palace people. I say, it is lucky for you that you came to me. The Tisrock, may he live forever, is so kind. We're asked to the palace almost every day, and it's like a second home. I love all the dear princes and princesses, and I positively adore Prince Rabidash. I might run in and see any of the palace ladies at any hour of the day or night. Why shouldn't I slip in with you after dark and let you out by the water door? There are always a few punts and things tied up outside it, and even if we were caught, I would be lost, said Erebus. Oh, darling, don't get so excited, said La Sarline. I was going to say, even if we were caught, everyone would only say it was one of my mad jokes. I'm getting quite well known for them. Only the other day, do listen, my dear, this is frightfully funny. I meant all would be lost for me said Erebus a little sharply. Oh, ah, uh, yes, I do see what you mean, darling. Well, can you think of any better plan? Erebus couldn't, and answered, No, we'll have to risk it. When can we start? Oh, not tonight, said Lazarline. Of course not tonight. There's a great feast on tonight. I must start getting my hair done for it in a few minutes, and the whole place will be blaze of lights, and such a crowd, too. It will have to be tomorrow night. This was bad news for Erebus, but she had to make the best of it. The afternoon passed very slowly, and it was a relief when Lazarline went out to the banquet, for Erebus was very tired of her giggling and her talk about dresses and parties, weddings and engagements and scandals. She went to bed early, and that part she did enjoy. It was so nice to have pillows and sheets again. But the next day passed very slowly. Lasarline wanted to go back on the whole arrangement, and kept on telling Erebus that Narnia was a country of perpetual snow and ice, inhabited by demons and sorcerers, and she was mad to think of going there. And with a peasant boy, too, said Lasarline. Darling, think of it. It's not nice. Erebus had thought of it a good deal. But she was so tired of Lasarline's silliness by now that, for the first time, she began to think that traveling with Shasta was really rather more fun than fashionable life in Tashban. So she only re replied, You forget that I'll be a nobody just like him when we get to Narnia. And anyway, I promised. And to think said Lasarline, almost crying, that if only you had sense you could be the wife of the Grand Vizier. Erebus went away to have a private word with the horses. "'You must go with a groom a little before sunset down, on the t down to the tombs,' she said. "'No more of those packs. You'll be saddled and bridled again, but there'll have to be food in Quinn's saddlebags and a full water skin behind yours, Bree. The man has orders to let you both have a good long drink at the far side of the bridge.' "'And then Narnia in the north,' whispered Bree. But what if Shasta is not at the tombs? Wait for him, of course, said Erebus. I hope you've been quite comfortable. Never better stabled in my life, said Bree. But if the husband of that tittering Tarkina friend of yours is paying his head groom to get the best oats, then I think the head groom is cheating him. Erebus and Lasarline had supper in the pillared room. About two hours later, they were ready to start. Erebus was dressed to look like a superior slave girl in a great house and wore a veil over her face. They had agreed that if any questions were asked, Lissarlene would pretend that Erebus was a slave she was taking as a present to one of the princesses. The two girls went out on foot. Very few minutes brought them to the palace gates. Here there were, of course, soldiers on guard, but the officer knew Lasarline quite well, and called his men to attention and saluted. They passed at once into the Hall of Black Marble. 
A fair number of courtiers, slaves, and others were still moving about here, but this only made the two girls less conspicuous. They passed on into the Hall of Pillars, and then into the Hall of Statues, and down the colonnade, passing great beaten copper doors of the throne room. It was all magnificent beyond description, what they could see of it in the dim light of the lamps. Presently they came out into the garden court, which sloped downhill in a number of terraces. On the far side of that they came to the old palace. It had already grown almost dark, and they now found themselves in a maze of corridors lit by only by occasional torches fixed in brackets to the walls. Lasarline halted at a place where you had to go either right or left. "'Go on, do go on,' whispered Erebus, whose heart was beating terribly, and who still felt that her father might run into them at any corner. "'I'm just wondering,' said Lasarline. I'm not ab absolutely sure which way we go from here. I think it's the left. Yes, I'm almost sure it's the left. What fun this is. They took the left-hand way and found themselves in a passage that was hardly lit at all, and which soon began going down steps. It's all right, said Lasarline. I'm sure we're right now. I remember these steps. But at that moment, a moving light appeared ahead. A second later, there appeared from round a distant corner the dark shapes of two men walking backwards and carrying tall candles. And, of course, it is only before royalties that people walk backwards. Erebus felt Lasarline grip her arm, that sort of sudden grip which is almost a pinch, and which means that the person who is gripping you is very frightened indeed. Erebus thought it odd that Lasarline should be so afraid of the Tisrock if he were really such a friend of hers, but there was no time to go on thinking. Lasarline was hurrying her back to the top of the steps on tiptoe and groping wildly along the wall. Here's the door, she whispered. Quick! They went in, drew the door very softly behind them, and found themselves in pitch darkness. Erebus could hear by Lasarline's breathing that she was terrified. Tash, preserve us, whispered Lasarline. We shall, what shall we do if he comes in here? Can we hide? There was a soft carpet under their feet. They groped forward into the room and blundered onto a sofa. Let's lie down behind it, whimpered Lasarline. Oh, I do wish we hadn't come. There was just room between the sofa and the curtained wall, and the two girls got down. Lasarline managed to get the better position, and was completely covered. The upper part of Erevis's face stuck out beyond the sofa, so that if anyone came into that room with a light, and happened to look in exactly the right place, they would see her. But of course, because she was wearing a veil, what they saw would not at once look like a forehead and a pair of eyes. Erebus shoved desperately to try to make Lasarline give her a little more room, but Lasarline, now quite selfish in her panic, fought back and pinched her feet. They gave it up and lay still, panting a little. Their own breath seemed dreadfully noisy, but there was no other noise. Is it safe? said Erebus at last in the tiniest possible whisper. I, I think so, began Lasarline. My poor nerves. And then came the most terrible noise they could have heard at that moment, the noise of the door opening. And then came light, and because Erebus couldn't get her head any further in behind the sofa, she saw everything. First came the two slaves, deaf and dumb, as Erebus rightly guessed, and therefore used at the most secret councils, walking backwards and carrying the candles. They took up their stand, one at each end of the sofa. This was a good thing, for of course it was now harder for anyone to see Erebus once a slave was in front of her, and she was looking between his heels. Then came an old man, very fat, wearing a curious pointed cap, by which she immediately knew that he was the Tisrock. The least of the jewels with which he was covered was worth more than all the clothes and weapons of the Narnian lords put together. But he was so fat, and such a mass of frills and pleats and baubles and buttons and tassels and talismans, talismans that Erebus couldn't help thinking the Narnian fashions, at any rate for men, looked nicer. 
After him came a tall young man with a feathered and jeweled turban on his head and an ivory-sheathed scimitar at his side. He seemed very excited, and his eyes and teeth flashed fiercely in the candlelight. Last of all came a little hump-backed, wizened old man in whom she recognized with a shudder the new grand vizier and her own betrothed husband, Ahoshta Tarkin himself. As soon as all three had entered the room and the door was shut, the Tisrock seated himself on the divan with a sigh of contentment. The young man took his place, standing before him, and the Grand Vizier got down on his knees and elbows and laid his face flat to the carpet. And that was the end of Chapter 7. Chapter 8 In the House of the Tisrock O oh, my father, and oh, the delight of my eyes, began the young man, muttering the words very quickly and sulkily, and not at all, as if the Tisrock were the delight of his eyes. May you live forever, but you have utterly destroyed me. If you had given me the swiftest of the galleys at sunrise, when I first saw that the ship of the accursed barbarians was gone from her place, I would perhaps have overtaken them. But you persuaded me to send first and see if they had not merely moved round the point into better anchorage. And now the whole day has been wasted, and they are gone, gone out of my reach. The false jade, the... And here he added a great many descriptions of Queen Susan, which would not look at all nice in print. For, of course, this young man was Prince Rabidash, and, of course, the false jade was Susan of Narnia. Compose yourself, O oh my son, said the Tishrock, for the departure of guests makes a wound that is easily healed in the heart of a judicious host. But I want her, cried the prince. I must have her. I shall die if I do not get her. False, proud, black-hearted daughter of a dog that she is. I cannot sleep, and my food has no savor, and my eyes are darkened because of her beauty. I must have the barbarian queen. How well it was said by a gifted poet, observed the vizier, raising his face in a somewhat dusty condition from the carpet, that deep draughts from the fountain of reason are desirable in order to extinguish the fire of youthful love. This seemed to exasperate the prince. Dog, he shouted, directing a series of well-aimed kicks at the hindquarters of the vizier. Do not dare to quote the poets at me. I have had maxims and verses flung at me all day, and I can endure them no more. I am afraid Aramis did not feel at all sorry for the vizier. The Tisrock was apparently sunk in thought, but when, after a long pause, he noticed what was happening, he said, My son. By all means desist from kicking the venerable and enlightened vizier, for as a costly jewel retains its value even if hidden in a dunghill, so old age and discretion are to be respected even in the vile persons of our subjects. Therefore, desist, and tell us what you desire and propose. I desire and propose, O oh my father, said Rabidash, that you immediately call out your invincible armies and invade the thrice accursed land of Narnia, and waste it with fire and sword and add it to your illimitable empire, killing their high king and all of his blood except the Queen Susan. For I must have her as my wife, though she shall learn a sharp lesson first. Understand, O oh my son, said the Tisrock that no words you can speak will move me to open war against Narnia. If you were not my father, O oh ever-living Tisrock, said the prince, grinding his teeth, I should say that was the word of a coward. And if you were not my son, no most inflammable rabidash, replied his father, your life would be short and your death slow when you had said it. The cool, placid voice in which he spoke these words made Erebus's blood run cold. But why, O oh my father, said the prince, this time in a much more respectful voice, why should we think twice about punishing Narnia any more than about hanging an idle slave or setting a worn-out horse to be made into dog's meat? 
It is not the fourth size of one of your least provinces. A thousand spears could conquer it in five weeks. It is an unseemly blot on the skirts of your empire. Most undoubtedly, said the Tisroc, these little barbarian countries that call themselves free, which is as much as to say idle, disordered, and unprofitable, are hateful to the gods and to all persons of discernment. Then why have we suffered such a land as Narnia to remain thus long unsubdued? Know, O oh enlightened prince, said the Grand Vizier, that until the year in which your exalted father began his salutary and unending reign, the land of Narnia was covered with ice and snow, and was moreover ruled by a most powerful enchantress. This I know very well, O oh loquacious vizier, answered the, pr the prince, but I know also that the enchantress is dead, and the ice and snow have vanished, so that Narnia is now wholesome, fruitful, and delicious. And the change, this change, O oh most learned prince, has doubtless been brought to pass by the powerful incantations of those wicked persons who now call themselves kings and queens of Narnia. I am rather of the opinion, said Rabadash, that it has come about by the alteration of the stars and the operation of natural causes. All this, said the Tisroc, is a question for the disputations of learned men. I will never believe that so great an alternation, alteration and the killing of the old enchantress were effected without the aid of strong magic. Such things are to be expected in that land which is chiefly inhabited by demons in the shape of beasts that talk like men, and monsters that are half man and half beast. It is commonly reported that the High King of Narnia, whom may the gods utterly reject, is supported by a demon of hideous aspect, an irresistible maleficence, another hard word, who appears in the shape of a lion. Therefore, the attacking of Narnia is a dark and doubtful enterprise, and I am determined not to put my hand out farther than I can draw it back. How blessed is Calamon, said the vizier, popping up his face again, on whose ruler the gods have been pleased to bestow prudence and circumspection. Yet, as the irrefutable and sapient Tisroc has said, it is very grievous to be constrained to keep our hands off such a dainty dish as Narnia. Gifted was the poet who said. But at this point, Ahoshta noticed an impatient movement of the prince's toe and became suddenly silent. It is very grievous, said the Tisroc in his deep, quiet voice. Every morning the sun is darkened in my eyes and every night my sleep is the less refreshing because I remember that Narnia is still free. O oh, my father, said Rapidash, how if I show you a way by which you can stretch out your arm to take Narnia and yet draw it back unharmed if the attempt prove unfortunate? If you can show me that, O oh, Rapidash, said the Tisroc, you will be the best of sons. Here then, O oh, father, this very night, and in this hour, I will take but two hundred horse, and ride across the desert, and it shall seem to all men that you know nothing of my going. On the second morning I shall be at the gates of King Loon's castle of Anvard in Arkenland. They are at peace with us, and unprepared, and I shall take Anvard before they have bestirred themselves. Then I will ride through the pass above Anvard, and down through Narnia to Caerparavel, the High King will not be there. When I left him, he was already preparing a raid against the giants on his northern border. I shall find Caerparavel most likely with open gates and ride in. I shall exercise prudence and courtesy, courtesy and spill as little Narnian blood as I can. And what then remains but to sit there till the splendor Hyaline puts in? With Queen Susan on board, catch my strayed bird as she sets foot ashore, swing her into the saddle, and then ride, ride, ride back to Envard. But it is, is it not probable, O oh my son, said the Tisroc, that at the taking of the woman, either King Edmund or you will lose his life? 
It will be a small company, said Rabidash, and I will order ten of my men to disarm and bind him, restraining my vehement desire for his blood, so that there shall be no deadly cause of war between you and the High King. And how, if the splendor high line is at Care Paravel before you? I do not look for that with these winds, O oh my father. And lastly, O oh my resourceful son, said the Tishrock, you have made clear how all this might give you the barbarian woman, but not how it helps me to the overthrowing of Narnia. O oh my father, can it have escaped you that though i and my horsemen will come and go through narnia like an arrow from a bow yet we shall have anvard forever and when you hold anvard you sit in the very gate of narnia and your garrison in anvard can be increased by little and little till it is a great host it is spoken with understanding and foresight but how do i drop back my arm if this miscarries you shall say that I did it without your knowledge, and against your will, and without your blessing, being constrained by the violence of my love and the impetuosity of youth. And how, if the High King then demands that we send back the barbarian woman, his sister? Oh, my, my father, be assured that he will not. For though the fancy of a woman has rejected this marriage, the High King Peter is a man of prudence and understanding, who will in no way wish to lose the high honor and advantage of being allied to our house, and seeing his nephew and grandnephew on the throne of Calamon. He will not see that if I live forever, as is no doubt your wish, said the Tisrock in a drier voice than usual. And also, O oh my father, and O oh the delight of my eyes, said the prince, after a moment of awkward silence, we shall write letters as if from the queen to say that she loves me and has no desire to return to Narnia, for it is well known that women are as changeable as weathercocks, and even if they do not wholly believe the letters, they will not dare to come to Tashman in arms to fetch her. O oh, enlightened vizier, said the Tishrock. Bestow your wisdom upon us concerning this strange proposal. O oh, eternal Tishrock, answered Ahoshta, the strength of paternal affection is not unknown to me, and I have often heard that sons are in the eyes of their fathers more precious than carbuncles. How then shall I dare freely to unfold to you in my, my mind in a matter which may imperil the life of this exalted prince? Undoubtedly you will dare replied the Tisrock, because you will find that the dangers of not doing so are at least equally great. To hear is to obey, moaned the wretched, wretched man. Know then, O most reasonable Tisrock, in the first place, that the danger of the prince is not altogether so great as it might appear, for the gods have withheld from the barbarians the light of discretion, as that their poetry is not like ours, full of choice apophagens and muse useful maxims, but is all of love and war, and therefore nothing will appear to them more noble and admirable than such a mad enterprise as this of— Ow! For the prince, at the word mad, had kicked him again. Desist, O oh my son, said the distraught. And you, estimable viz vizier, whether he desists or not, by no means allow the flow of your eloquence to be interrupted, for nothing is more suitable to persons of gravity and decorum than to endure minor inconveniences with constancy. To hear is to obey, said the vizier, wriggling himself around a little so as to get his hinder parts further away from Rabidash's toe. Nothing, I say, will seem as pardonable, if not estimable, in their eyes as this er, hazardous attempt, especially because it is undertaken for the love of a woman. Therefore, if the prince by misfortune fell into their hands, they would assuredly not kill him. Nay, it may even be that though he failed to carry off the queen, yet the sight of his great valor and the, of the extremity of his passion might incline her heart to him. That is a good point, you old blabber, said Rabidash. Very good, however it came into your ugly head. The praise of my masters is the light of my eyes, said Ahoshta, 
And secondly, O oh, Tisrock, whose reign must and shall be interminable, I think that with the aid of the gods it is very likely that Anvard will fall into the prince's hand, and if so, we have Narnia by the throat. There was a long pause, and the room became so silent that the two girls hardly dared to breathe. At last the Tisrock spoke. Go, my son, he said, and, and do as you have said, and expect no help nor countenance from me. I will not avenge you if you are killed, and I will not deliver you if the barbarians cast you into prison. And if, either in success or failure, you shed a drop more than you need of Narnian noble blood, and open war arises from it, my favor shall never fall upon you again, and your next brother shall have your place in Calamon. Now go. Be swift, secret, and fortunate. May the strength of Tash, the inexorable, the irresistible, be in your sword and lance. To hear is to obey, cried Rabidash, and after kneeling for a moment to kiss his father's hands, he rushed from the room. Greatly to the disappointment of Aravis, who was now horribly cramped, the Tisrock and Vizier remained. O oh, Vizier, said the Tisrock, is it certain that no living soul knows of this council we three have held here tonight? O oh, my master, said Ahoshta, it is not possible that any should know. For that very reason I proposed, and you and your wisdom agreed, that we should meet here in the old palace, where no council is ever held, and none of the household has any occasion to come. It is well, said the Tisrock. If any man knew, I would see to it that he died before an hour had passed. And do you also, O prudent vizier, forget it? I sponge away from my own heart and from yours all knowledge of the prince's plans. He is gone without my knowledge or my consent. I know not whither, because of his violence and the rash and disobedient disposition of youth. No man will be more astonished than you and I to hear that Anvard is in his hands. To hear is to obey, said Hahoshta. That is why you will never think, even in your secret heart, that I am the hardest-hearted of fathers, who thus sends my first-born son on an errand so likely to be his death, pleasing as it must be to you who do not love the prince, for I see into the bottom of your mind. O oh, impeccable Tisrock, said the vizier, in comparison with you I love neither the prince nor my own life, nor bread nor water nor the light of the sun. Your sentiments are elevated and correct. I also love none of these things in comparison with the glory and strength of my throne. If the prince succeeds, we have Arkenland and perhaps hereafter Narnia. If he fails, I have eighteen other sons, and Rabidash, after the manner of the eldest sons of kings, was beginning to be dangerous. More than five Tisrocks in Tashpan have died before their time because their eldest sons, enlightened princes, grew tired of waiting for the throne. He had better cool his blood abroad than boil it in inaction here. And now, O oh excellent vizier, the excess of my paternal anxiety inclines me to sleep. Command the musicians to my chamber, but before you lie down, call back the pardon we wrote for the third cook feel within me the manifest prognostics of indigestion. To hear is to obey, said the Grand Vizier. He crawled backwards on all fours to the door, rose, bowed, and went out. Even then the Tisrock remained seated, remained seated on the divan in silence until Erevis almost began to be afraid that he had dropped asleep. But at last, with a great creaking and sighing, he heaved up his enormous body, signed to the slaves to precede him with the lights, and went out. The door closed behind him. The room was once more totally dark, and the two girls could breathe freely again. And that is the end of chapter 8. We'll see you tomorrow.